It's the Immigrant Unfiltered Podcast with Hamza Ali. All right, let's get started. You ready? Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> so I reached out to you on, on TikTok out of all places, you know, everything that could have been done. We found each other on TikTok. We're both in real estate. We did a, we did we do a bunch of cool stuff. I, I checked out your profile. You know your move. Your you were transitioning at the time, but I really want to understand. And I guess my first question is, who is Baha Savage? So Savage sometimes confuses my clients. It confuses people when I tell them, "Yeah, my name is Baha Savage." They look at me like, "She's serious? Is that really her name?" And um, Savage for me means courage. Um, resilience, strength, and bravery. And I feel like I embody um, those characteristics with my life experiences um, that I faced and was able to be like an alchemist and transform them into something else where if it was another individual, it probably would have took them down. So um, savage in my business means that I'm gonna get the job done. I'm going to do it. I'm going to figure out a way if I don't know how to do it, or I'm going to find a person that can do it. But um, that's kind of what intimidates my competitors because they know that I believe in myself to that extent. I really like that point. Intimidate your competitors. Walk me through that. What, <laughs> what, what does that mean? So real estate is um, an oversaturated market. Everyone's a realtor. You're going to have a family member that's a realtor, a friend that's a realtor. Everyone can, it's basically an easy way to just get in the business. It's, you don't even need a high school diploma to get in this business. Six weeks, you got your license, right? Everybody can be a realtor. In fact, talking about everybody can be a realtor, here's a funny story. Mm -hmm. When I came in, first thing I did is I got my realtor's license. Oh. When I brought my wife in, she got a real estate license. Uh, we actually had to let it go because it was a conflict of interest with, with our business. But mm -hmm. you're right. Everybody can get a real estate license, and it really takes somebody to push it and make it something that's like money, you know what I mean? And I think that's something that you were, you were trying to touch on. But I wasn't only driven by money. I enjoyed genuinely helping people and solving problems in the marketplace. When I first got my license... Um, when was this? When did you this get was license? in 2019 of April. And I actually failed my exam four times. So the fifth time that I went in there, the instructor was looking at me like, oh, here she comes again. <laughs> Every time I go out crying, you know, and I'm like, I'm never going to be able to do it. But that actually made me want it more. And I was like, you know what, as soon as I get this. And then the people I went to school with, they got their license. They never did nothing with it. And I was like so upset because, you know, I'm still here trying to figure it out. And I'm like, OK, I can't even make any money yet. So when I went in the fifth time, I read all my duas. I read <laughs> all my prayers. I prayed in the middle of the night, everything. You know, I was studying. And um, alhamdulillah, I passed. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to make use of this license. I'm going to make a million dollars this year. I was just like putting all these high hopes and dreams out there because dream big. Why not, you know? Yeah. Um, any real estate background prior to you getting your license? Like what was... What was your world growing up like? Was there any influence that, that, that made you think like, yeah, this is it. I want to knock it out. So that's a really good question. Um, I, before real estate, I was a makeup artist. I was always an entrepreneur. Um, I just never believed in exchanging my valuable time for money, a currency, um, because I, I understood that money was energy. And in order... For us to move around and do the things we want, we need energy. So I didn't want to give up my valuable time, that's for sure. I worked, when I first came to America, I was 18 years old. So why don't we just backtrack? Yeah, let's backtrack. Let's so you backtrack. said when you first came to America, you were 18. So now, yeah. I was born in the West Bank. I was a year old okay. when I moved to America. And I grew up in Houston okay. for 15 years. Okay. And then when I was 15 years old, uh, my dad, he took me back to my country in Palestine, and he married me off to my first cousin. Um, is that typical? That was not uh, typical, but it's pretty normal. Okay, and how um, old was your cousin? He was 27 at the time. Okay, so twice your age, almost. Yeah. Okay. So that marriage just didn't work out. He was very physically abusive, and I was put in a place where either I stay or I might end up dead or in the hospital or whatever. Like, it got to that point, or I had to make a decision to come to America, and I had a baby boy at that time. His name is Muhammad. He's 10 years old now, but um, and he's still in my country, Palestine. Yeah. Um, 
so I had to make a really harsh decision whether to come to America, which I had no life experience, no work experience, no support system. I mean, you were you were a child basically oh, when you yeah. left. Now, did your ne- dad know about the abuse? Yeah, he knew. Um, and was he supportive? He was not supportive. He was the start of it. I understand what mm-hmm. a not supportive parent yeah. looks like. So I just want you to know that, you know, it kind of molds you into the person you end up becoming somehow. And... You know, there's many, of course, I can never put myself in your shoes. I mean, you know, you have a child, he's outside Mm -hmm. the country. Obviously, you do a lot of things for him and you want to do a lot of things for him. Um, But it kind of, and and you can tell me, yes, I agree with you on this or no, I disagree with you on, but it kind of toughens you up to the point where you're like, okay, I'm going to get this and Mm -hmm. I'm going to get it done. Yeah, and so that's why I'm grateful for these experiences. I, I never victimized myself. I always saw the blessings and the disaster even when I didn't see a way out. Um, and, you know, I forgive my father. I knew that he did the best that he can. Um, and and I'm just very grateful. Um, he still doesn't talk to me. He actually um, taunts me, even though I've reached a pinnacle of success. Um, he still doesn't talk to me. But I came to America when I was 18, literally with $20 in my pocket. And um, my family... They disowned me for leaving the marriage. And I've never worked a job before. I didn't even know what was the social security. I didn't know where I was going to sleep. I didn't know what I was going to do when I first came here. But as soon as I landed, I was just kissing the ground. And everyone was looking at me like I was crazy. <laughs> like, what's wrong with this girl? She says, kissing the ground. I knew this was the land of opportunity. That's for sure. And I wanted to um, take advantage of this Opportunity, because when I lived in poverty over there in Palestine, where genocide's happening, tanks are coming down three in the morning, and if you turn on a light, they might shoot at you. And you know, I'm over here breastfeeding my son, scared like, what's gonna happen? And um, yeah, it, it was a really, really tough experience to live over there. And my heart goes out to everyone that's Syria, Palestine, uh, Yemen, all yeah, the places they that... They just had that huge earthquake. Yeah, tur- in Turkey and yeah. Palestine, yeah, subhanAllah. Um, may Allah grant them shifa. But um, yeah, so I I came here, I was like kissing the ground, and then I was like, okay, time to find a job. So I went to <laughs> apply at a hookah lounge um, as a waitress. And like, mind you, I didn't even have a phone. I didn't even know where I was going to sleep. And um, I applied there. They asked for my social security. I didn't know what that was. And somehow I winged it. First week I started working there. Um, I made like $500. I got myself a phone. And where I was sleeping, actually, you know, this is going to sound crazy, but, um, you know, like 24-hour fitness, I was in the restroom, like the family restroom. That's where I figured it out, like Mm -hmm. until I got on my feet. So anyways, I got myself a phone the first week. Second week, um, I had I made like, $700, $800. $700, $800. I went and put a down payment on a car. I didn't know how to drive. It was a, a Buick, but I didn't know how to drive. And when the guy was asking me, where's your license? I was like, uh, it's at home. And then I was like, Bismillah. So I was just like trying to figure it out. And I started sleeping there. How much was the there. car for? Um, I just put $500 and that's kind of yeah okay. where I started. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I started sleeping in my car. I, had, I was working a waitress job. And when I was working there for about a, um, a month, Um, you know, I made just enough money to just like get myself an apartment. So one month, okay, now I have the car, I have a phone and I have an apartment, the basic needs. Um, I just didn't feel like this was going to get me to where I wanted to be in life. And, um, so I started reflecting like one, one of my strongest straight traits that I have is that I do a lot of self-reflection and um, I lead myself a lot. So, and what does that look like? And what that looks like is personal development books. I read. I started reading a lot of personal development books. I was reflecting one night and I said, you know what? I don't have. I never finished high school. I dropped out in ninth grade because my dad took me overseas and got me married. Um, I didn't have any education to fall back on. Um, So I started looking. I was like, what am I really good at? What can I capitalize on? What's a skill set that I can capitalize on? and um, do really good. So I was good at makeup. And so I started marketing myself to uh, weddings, um, what you call it, like parties, and started to do makeup from there. And I enjoyed it because it didn't, it didn't feel like a job for me. I enjoyed doing makeup. I enjoyed making women feel more beautiful. And um, that took off for me. So um, 
I was able to elevate my lifestyle from there. And what introduced real estate into the game was when I started reading like a lot of um, like Jim Ron, Brian Tracy, um, Les Brown. I was listening to a lot of like my first year, I read over 27 books. Wow. That's how much I was addicted to it. And I, and I was and like, these were hmm. actually like reading, not audio yeah, books reading. Or, or like a combination. Reading. reading. Okay. I lived a very disciplined lifestyle. I was always working out. Um, I was always trying to um, just place myself in good environments and because you are a product of your environment. And um, even though I didn't have a mentor in real life, everything was books and just online. After like reading so many books, I was thinking, hmm, makeup is not doing it for me. Yes, I'm making money. Yes, I'm, I'm content, but I'm not where I, I'm not satisfied where, with where I want to be. I want to I want to be able to make 10 million, 15 million a year, you know, 20 million. How can I do that with just makeup? I can't do that. So one day I was like, so the law of attraction is right. Whatever you think about, you attract. So I put out a thought that morning. And I was like, hmm, I want I want I want to know what's my next career path. So I was working. I was like working out and um, went to a, a bookstore and I started reading this book and I was just doing my thing. Right. And then um, somebody walked in we were having a conversation and he was a real estate agent and he just mentioned to me, I think you should be a real estate agent. You'll do really good. And I was like, hmm, real estate agent. So I started looking it up and um, next day I went and applied at Champions, Champions. School of Real Estate and um, I started taking my classes and even though I had absolutely no interest in real estate whatsoever, um, I came from a broken home so I wasn't like really... Uh, fascinated with looking at houses and oh this is cute let's let's put it on the contract I wasn't into real estate at all but um, once I started going to school and just realizing um, this could probably not be for me and I wasn't even still into it at the time but while I was in school um, we came across commercial real estate and I my heart was drawn to commercial even though it's a more sophisticated industry to be in and um, I like I said, once I finished school, um, I did start off residential. I, w I was thinking about getting into a, a full-time commercial brokerage, and as I was applying, however, I am happy with where I'm at, um, I've noticed uh, a disinterest from a lot of these commercial brokers because it's predominantly male, mm -hmm. a, a Caucasian yes. industry, so, right? A so, bunch of white people. Yeah, so I once they see my email signature that I sent them, you know, my resume and yeah, so I'm just like, okay, even though I have all the success, I still have to keep proving myself. I have to work 10 times harder um, just to establish a name in this industry. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. Um, just because you're a woman, probably because you're Muslim, you know, Middle Eastern, there's probably a lot of doors that don't open up. Um, and easily. my age as and, well. Oh, and your age. I think your age is a benefit, honestly. Uh, In the beginning, it wasn't. A lot of people didn't want to hire me because they, they were thinking, why should I hire this kid? They're yeah. going to know how to deal with this asset, you know? They're not, in the beginning, it wasn't. But now it's a benefit because in the commercial industry, we got a lot of commercial brokers are in their 60s and 70s, and they're not able to move like they used to and yeah. get things done and... So do, yeah. <laughs> you, do you think the fact that a lot of people told you no because of your age drove you even harder? Mm -hmm. It did? Every time I heard a no, it just motivated me to get closer to a yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of what built it for you. And you were like, you know what, I'm going to show you. And now you're here. And now you kind of shown them. And now you're moving the next step. Whereas a lot of people, statistically, people who don't, in, brokers or realtors who don't invest in real estate by the time they're 50, get stuck in a dead end real estate job that is only transactional. And they have no investments to fall back on, which means they have to keep working till they're 60, 70, even for... I've actually met some of these people. So it's mm -hmm. very interesting you say that I want to be an investor. <laughs> so walk us through that journey. So now investments, you know, you're looking at commercial, you're mm -hmm. looking at investment opportunities. What do those look like? Yeah, so um, right now we're building 110 townhomes in Saxe, Texas, right across... Um, the street from a masjid that's being constructed. It's a new masjid. There's already one there. Um, and this is an affordable community we're building for others. And we've made it so easy to gain access to this community with just $50,000. You can reserve your lot. And we're pricing them in um, 360 to 416 
range, um, which is very competitive because Grand Homes, not even half a mile from us, is listed at 460. You know, so um, it's 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 finding an opportunity before others find it is is important as well, and um, and also finding a need that's underserved. I feel like us Muslims were so behind in our time with real estate in general because people are, it's like a taboo topic. You're in real estate, oh, haram, interest, you're dealing with interest. You know, like it's so taboo, right? Where I was like, okay, you know what? Even me, I'm trying to find ways, how can we avoid interest? There's seller wraparound financing, there's seller financing, there's so many ways you can avoid the like the interest, but if you never got into it, you would not know than to just avoid it all in total. But um, yeah, so I have that project going on. I'm, I'm purchasing a few for myself. I have investors who are purchasing as well. We're turning some of them into um, Airbnbs. I have an Airbnb business on the side as well. Yeah. Um, and I was managing Airbnbs for others, helping them start it and manage it. But when you're dealing with too many personalities and stuff, there's you know, my reputation, I wanna make sure I take care of it. So. Um, yeah, so I have an Airbnb business on the side, and um, I've also have done some equity share deals with some of my clients. Like if there's um, a, a commercial asset or a residential asset where they're comfortable forming a syndication, and um, instead of taking my full commission, I would just take a little, and then I'll just roll it into the deal, and right. that way, long run, I'll have you know some benefits. So. Um, that's how I'm thinking about it. I'm not really, like, there's many times where I've waived my commission to make deals work. I'm not looking, I'm not a realtor. I would consider myself an investor. Okay. So that's actually a pretty cool tactic, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what you just did. Mm -hmm. um, when you put, throw your commission into the deal, that tells your potential buyer that, hey, this person believes in this deal, mm -hmm. And I'm going to get, and they're actually throwing their money in. But what you've also guaranteed on the back end is that when you want to sell it, now you're an investor. So that deal ain't going nowhere unless it's represented by you. So you've guaranteed your commission in a way on the back end. Um, and it's a pretty cool strategy. And I'll tell you what, when I had first started my real estate journey, uh, the one broker that I used the most was the broker that threw his commission in mm. on all of my deals. And he was like, you know what, I'm going to throw this commission in. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's amazing. But then on the back end, when it came time to sell, uh, my rule of law was always the house that brought me the deal is the house that's going to sell the deal. Mm -hmm. um, so he always got to sell the deal. And he was always appreciative because he made money on the deal, plus he made guaranteed commission on the exits. And our exits are like five, five, three to five-year turnaround. So really good strategy. You know, Keep doing that. Deal's not going anywhere. When it's time to sell, you'll, you'll be the number one person. And you'll <laughs> have made money on the deal as well. So, okay, now let's talk about all of this success and you're doing, and let's mm -hmm. go back a little bit. You have a little boy, mm -hmm. and you talked about him a little bit. What, what are your hopes and aspirations for, for that little boy? What, what is gonna happen? What does the future look like? I wish that I could talk to him and see him every day, but unfortunately, that's been taken from me. Um, so just to be clear, there's yeah. internet, there's phones, everything's available. It's available, but they don't allow him to speak to me. He doesn't know I'm his mother yet, um, because they don't want him to find out the truth and come to America and live with me. They, she, my aunt, um, which is my mother-in-law, has raised him and she has this emotional attachment to him as if she's his mother. So I would never do what they've done to me, which is restrict you know, a son from communicating with their mother. But if I had the opportunity, I would bring her to live here with me and my son to live with me and we can, you know, be like a big happy family, but I wanted to set an example for my son that despite you know the circumstances, you can be great. You are a co-creator of your life and your destiny. And with Allah, anything is possible because when I came here, it was pure tawakkal. It's like the bird that leaves hungry in the morning and comes back, you know, with the full stomach and able to feed all their children, right? And the brain of a bird is like this small. <laughs> so it's like just having so much tawakkal and yakin in Allah and just taking the step forward in um, whatever you want to do in life. And Allah will provide. He is the best of providers. And I just wanted to show my son that um, 
you can be somebody great and um, not to follow the crowd. Be unique, be, be you, you know, be unique and be you. Um, and I want to leave behind so many properties for him. So, lo subhanAllah, something ever happened to me, he has something to fall back on. And have you talked about this at all with them? Like with your mother-in-law that, hey, if I had this plan, would you guys? I've tried, but unfortunately some people are not, um, you know, compliant. So. And how old is she? She's probably 57. Okay, so fairly young. Like, you know, uh, relatively young. I mean, I'm, you know, uh, <laughs> it's not like she's in a phase of her life where she is, you know, yeah. going through dementia or other type of things, you know, <laughs> which is which happens, I guess, in the 80s or 70s and if you've tried to talk to her what is the feedback every ramadan i always try hoping that their hearts soften but nothing happens <laughs> i give up <laughs> um i'm just gonna continue uh working and my son is gonna get old enough to an age where he'll realize the truth on his own and you know when he does eventually meet with me um he will see the truth yeah. I'm not worried about that. And as far as citizenship, like your, does your son have American citizenship? He's not an American citizen. I'm only an American citizen. I tried to pass down citizenship to him, but I need to apply for a visa for him in order to bring him here. But for me to do that, he, um, I need pictures. I need, I need to be, you know, in contact with him. So. Okay. So you need to be able to get all that done. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, <laughs> I, you know, you are paving the way you're making everything right so that one day when he does realize uh, inshallah and you know he does figure it out he's gonna be here um let's talk about your husband a little bit your ex-husband rather H what's the dynamic there my father he was um working at the texas children hospital and um, as, as a doctor uh, not as a doctor i believe i don't know how physician or something like this he was working there, and then when 9-11 happened, they um, started laying off some Muslims and stuff. So my, my dad got fired, and then he started his limousine company um, in Houston, and it was called Abiding Limousine. But he started off with one town car, and I saw him build his fleet. He had over 20 limousines, three shuttle buses, um, and... Even when he was building his limousine company, we were still actively working. Like he would have me and my sister, my brother clean up the cars and stuff like this. So it's not like anything was given to us. Even if we wanted like a, a Wii system or a PlayStation 4, we had to work for it. Nothing was given. Um, so all my life, I understood the value of money in a sense. Um, so... My dad, he ended up selling his limousine company uh, for $4 million and bought a ranch, and now he's farming. His, on the ranch? On the ranch, yeah. But, but he still has money? I mean, he's retired. Okay. Yeah. So he's a millionaire, retired on a ranch, mm -hmm. and, uh, and where's the ranch? In Huntsville, Texas. Okay, so not too far from Houston. Yeah. Okay, interesting. And so does he tell you to hang out with him on the ranch? or? What? I always initiate the uh, conversation I always try to come and see them because I still see them like babies in my eyes no matter how old they're getting and stuff they look like babies you know I don't have any anger or hatred towards them even though I've been the one afflicted with a lot of pain um and <sighs> it's just unfortunately I'm not going to chase a love that's like, I didn't ask to be here. I didn't ask to be born, you know? It's, I didn't tell him to bring me to this world. If we're not like pets to play with us when we're cute and the first problem that happens, you throw us to the trash, you know? It doesn't give you a card to abuse your children and n neglect them and then expect them to come out to be the greatest, right? Luckily, alhamdulillah, I got out of a very, very dark phase in my life. I wasn't wearing the hijab always. I was not this person that you see today. I did a whole 360 in my life, but I hit rock, rock, rock bottom. And um, I'm glad to be alive right now, honestly. And like I said, I, I forgive my father. I love him for the sake of Allah. And not everyone is blessed with, unfortunately, the best parents. Um, but yeah, and if you do have that in your life, 
you should cherish it because um, it's 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 pure it's pure gold. What are your days like today? So you transact, you invest. Uh, what else? Yeah. So I live, like I said, a very disciplined lifestyle. Um, I'm asleep usually in bed, 9 30, 10 o'clock max. Um, I'm not on social media for a whole year now, so that's really helped um, with my focus in everything that I'm doing and um, just not endlessly scrolling. So I'm in bed at 10 o'clock max, and then I'm up at 4.50, 5 in the morning. I pray my five daily prayers, pray Fajr. Um, I sit and reflect and read one or two pages of Quran, and then I get up, get dressed, and go to the gym. And right now, I'm just doing, focused on very light cardio. Last year, I was doing a lot of MMA. I was actually training at Fortis MMA. Um, that's where the UFC fighters train and stuff. So that was a very boyish sport. So I'm transitioning out of that and trying to get into my feminine energy. Um, anyways, uh, so after I finish my workout, my meetings usually start at 8.30 in the morning. Um, I would already have prepped um, my schedule a week in advance and a day in advance, um, and of course a month in advance. So I try to set 10 new appointments every week with buyers or sellers. I try to close 10 deals every month, whether it's commercial or residential. And um, from 10 to 12, I try to follow up, nurture my database, which is around 130,000, and I'm transitioning to a new CRM system, but it's a lot of people to stay in touch with. Did you um, say 130,000 people? Yes. Okay. And, and this is in all 50 states, commercial. And, and where did that database come from? That's CoStar. 130,000 people. Some of them from CoStar, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That's a, that's a huge, massive database. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, I nurture my database. I schedule my meetings, like I said, either from 12 to um, 3, I'm in meetings. And then around 4 to 5, I'm winding down. I'm winding down from my work because before I was working 12, 18 hours a day. And I started realizing how um, inefficient I've become with overworking myself. And um, now from 4 to 5, I'm winding down, um, either taking a nap and then 6 o'clock if I have to write any contracts or whatever, I'm starting to delegate. I'm not doing a lot of, I'm firing myself from a lot of positions now. I'm starting to delegate uh, my tasks and just really focusing on income producing activities, which is getting in front of new buyers and sellers every day, searching for properties off market. Um, that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> so who taught you all this co-star maneuvering? Because this is like fairly complex stuff. I would think to like track all these things down and get the notifications and see who's moving in what market. So CoStar assigns a, uh, re a relationship rep and a sales rep. And if you have a really good one that's going to tell you all the secrets, you're lucky. Um, I um, was fortunate enough to have somebody that was really good. When I asked her, I was like, hey, how do I find 1031 exchange clients? Or how do I find uh, deals who that's closed directly to the owner six months ago, you know? She would show me how I can do use the filters. Using to know, learning how to use your systems and applying it to a strategy becomes deadly. One year break, what's going on? Social media obviously was how I was getting business, connecting with the community, but it also had a negative impact um, on me because you just don't know who's watching you and you don't know um, what their intentions are. I've actually curated a extremely disturbing stalker. Uh, been in, I've been getting um, harassed for about almost five years now from the stalker and it's become very severe uh, to the point where I ended up making multiple police reports and actually had them arrested and it still didn't stop from there. So um, that's why I'm taking my break, but I will eventually be back. Um, I haven't reached my potential on what I want to do with the platform. Um, and uh, while I'm taking this year break, I have found other ways to drive and make deal, drive business and make deals happen um, outside of social media. Because and in my business, it requires me to kind of flaunt right. my success and right. what I'm doing and what I'm closing. And it also brings evil eye and it brings people who, do, who are not in the best situations and will not wish the best for you. 
tell us a little bit more. So you said five years. Yeah. Now this is, I'm assuming, prior to TikTok, prior to social media. No, as soon as I got on social media. On social. Yeah. And immediately you had the stalker, yeah. guy. No, it was a lady. It was a lady. Yeah, it's not a guy, and, it's a and, lady. And what is the stalking about? Like, wh what are they trying to do? Like, take your deals or like religious or what's going on there? So she thinks I'm trying to take her cousin's She's her cousin is a real estate agent. She thinks I'm trying to take her cousin's business, which I'm not even in the same, you know, bracket with her. I'm focusing on commercial. I'm focusing on other things. Uh, and they teamed up to try to sabotage my reputation and um, use things like, you know, my father's situation and things like this against me. So these are people and that know you. They don't. I don't know them, but, but they somehow know. they know me. And they're in your same community? I'm in the same community. They live in Dallas. And um, they've uh, done some very crazy things where it got to the point where they started harassing my clients. They somehow got their number. They reached out to my broker. They've uh, made me lose deals with some of the harassment that they've done. Um, you know, it's just basically this lady said she wanted to burn me alive, you know, and I don't even know who this person is. Like when somebody has that much hatred towards you, it gets scary. You're yeah. like, okay, well, let me just get off social media, not let them not see me happy. Anytime I would post any of my success or happiness, she attacks. I don't want to live on the edge worth knowing like, oh my God, here we go again. Here's the next attack. And I don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah. She's contacting my agents and everyone's asked her, what do you want? Do you want money? Do you, what's going to make you stop? Like, what is it? She says, nothing. So it's just like, there's black and there's white and this situation doesn't make sense. So, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you're taking a break. You're going to be back. Of course, look, as a content creator, forget everything yeah. else, but as a content creator, I feel like there's a lot of emotional effort that we put um, into creating mm -hmm. content. I mean, I know it's just 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes, long form, whatever it is. It really takes, it drains us a lot. Um, and you have to be in the right mental space to be able to create. And what you create needs to be the best of the best because that's what the algorithms want as well. And if you're not in the right state, uh, definitely take a break. But this is one thing that I have learned with people, uh, with certain people who just like to attack. Sometimes, and agree and disagree with me on mm -hmm. this, uh, sometimes an attack can only be matched with a bigger attack. And I say that from my personal experience. Whenever I get attacked on social media, because I get attacked, you know, similar things you brought, interest, haram, mm -hmm. everything you're doing is a lie. You know, all the, all the, the you're a scam, you're this, right? Whatever it is, we're constantly getting mm -hmm. attacked and we're constantly getting attacked by what I like to call what is it called? Muslim talk or whatever it is, right? Those are the number one haters. Now, the, what I have found is either I can take a break or I can go on the offense. And sometimes when I go on the offense, everything else quiets down. Mm -hmm. But you In tell my me situation, even though I've completely ignored this individual, I would assume after a year or two, you don't pay any attention, it would stop. It just got worse and worse and worse. And the more success I accumulated, the more she is like losing her mind, wanting to destroy it all. So I was like, okay, this is obviously a jinn that Allah put in this world <laughs> against me. I don't know what it is, but it needs to go. It needs to go. <laughs> um, I saw in one, of the, in one of the questions that you answered, you said you, your ultimate goal one day is to build a mosque. Yes. Let's talk about that. Yes, yeah, so inshallah... Um, I even in whenever I close a deal for my Muslim clients, I give them a prior rug that fits four or five people on there, right? I always think for my akhirah, like all of this is gonna go. All the money is gonna go. Not, we're not taking nothing with us, but our deeds. And I'm always trying to plant seeds for my akhirah. And building a masjid is just gonna, you know, guarantee me a condo in Jannah, inshallah. Ya <laughs> I'm going to be sitting with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, so let's talk about <laughs> so, the mosque. Yeah, the mosque. Now, I have not started on the project yet. I do donate to, um, which we call it, mosques and stuff like that. Like the Saxe Mosque is being built. Um, I'm trying to identify an area, which is Rockwall is one of the cities that I'm looking at because there's not a mosque in that area. Um, where we can possibly construct with my commercial side of the business we're always like I have 20 acres of land in Rockwall right now that the developers looking to develop the 
uh, 11 acres for residential, the rest of it's commercial, so we can really fit um, a mosque there if we want to. So I'm trying right now to find the right deal, the right opportunity, and I will go in and on it the same way I'm doing with my other deals, inshallah. Have, have you ever run a mosque or do you? I, I'm, I'm not the person that's a jack of all trades. I'm going to give it off to the, okay. a great leader. I'm right now also helping this uh, nonprofit organization called Ihya. They started in uh, COVID to, um, they have around 70 students right now. Um, they basically teach scholars, they're training scholars. So I'm already invested in um, organizations like this and we're helping them find, identify a place right now uh, to lease, but eventually they want to build um, a location in the mosque and, and all of that. So I'm, I'm, I'm right now piggybacking off of my resources and figuring out how it can all work together. So, yeah. Yeah, so basically you'll put the project together, mm -hmm. give it to someone who you think is a good leader yeah. and hopefully have them lead it. Yeah. Now, uh, just, a, just a question, because I have experience mm -hmm. with certain mosques in, in America and you know, I, I can tell you that being part or involved in any type of leadership in at that level gets very difficult from mosque to mosque and then there's just all this politics and then this one hate this mosque doesn't like this mosque and like how is that dynamic with you or how many how many houses of worship are you a part of so i am very active in the muslim community i attend this um, book club called roots i don't know if you've heard of heard of it it's by abdurrahman murphy he has a very nice connection with millennials and Gen Z, and it's a full house every Monday. Um, we, we study, like, we go over the Quran, we go over um, sirahs and just reflect on life, and he has different workshops going on throughout the week, and th that's why I love living in Dallas, because there's a lot of halakas, there's a lot of uh, activity going on with learning, and um, basically how it... Wait, what was your question? <laughs> Just the drama between the mosques. The drama between the mosques. And how you keep yourself clean and out of it. Yeah, I mean, I just go in there and learn whatever I need to learn, make whatever connections I need to do, and I'm just out. I don't, I don't get into the, the gossiping. I hate gossiping. Um, and just oh shit, man. That's, uh, I don't know what to say. Okay. All right. Well. <laughs> okay, end it. We've, we've, look, we've talked about... I think we've covered a lot of different things yeah. today and we've dug the, we've tried to dig as deep as we can mm -hmm. into you and your success, right? Mm -hmm. You have a huge future ahead of you. You're already, you know, massively successful. You know exactly what you're doing. Your strategies are impeccable. Your, you know, uh, your business mind and focus is on the next level, right? And there, like when I was your age, I can tell you like, I, I, you know, I was not at that level. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I got success a little later on in life. Um, so where you're at is just really hyper focus in your work. Now, as a person, what does your love life look like then? Do you have time for that? Is that something that you're going to be pursuing? Is that something that you see happening anytime in the near future? Or is it happening? Or will it? Or do you want it to? I think right now... Um I'm going to stay, remain focused on my career, and inshallah, when um, the right opportunity presents itself, it will happen. I have somebody in mind that is a very nice support system, has been um, very loving and caring towards me, and inshallah, if it's meant to be, it'll happen. What do you look for in a man? Or in a partner? I look for um, a responsible uh, God-fearing and as motivated and driven as me, um, family-orientated, um, because like I said, I didn't have that growing up, so I crave that a lot. And um, what else? What else do I look for? You, you touched on <laughs> motivated as driven and driven as you. Yeah. Right? Is that something that you think is easily found? It's not easily found. you got to be a part of the 1% of the 1%, right. but... If you're already in that bracket, then you're good. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, all right. So it's something, inshallah, that's in the works. And that'll, inshallah. Okay. That's very good to hear. It's funny because when I came to this country and people were like, yeah, you know, we're doing this. And then I look at them and they're just not like as, 
uh, running as hot as we're used to back home, right? It's crazy because everybody back home is working. And you mentioned this earlier on that you were, you know, helping your dad clean up cars, make sure the business is running. Everything you had was earned. Nothing was given. Very pretty. I would say it's a pretty much a, a standard story amongst all immigrants. And this is kind of how we all have to hustle and bustle, right? Um, how has that shaped you and what, and what do you think that is in comparison to other people? Yeah, so you have to remember a lot of the people that we work with in this work, uh, this space is a lot of, there's a lot of non-Muslims, right? And these non-Muslims, they don't, they, they're, they're fed all these negative things about us in the news that we're terrorists, or we're violent and, um, you, know, you know, like we need to show in our character that we are not what they paint us to be. And also me wearing the hijab has just really like demanded um, the respect because people respect whenever you stand firmly to who you, who you are, your character, right? Um, because we live in a society where there's very weak character. Not everyone uh, follows through with what they say they are. And um, I think like it's our responsibility also as Muslims to um, look at it as an opportunity to like it's imagine if you this person in front of you is dying from spiritual thirst right um, and you have this gift to share with them like you have water to give them and you decide not to give it to them and they die you know um, that's that's selfish I think it's selfish of us if we don't share um, we don't have to necessarily lecture them, but share our our gift, which is being Muslim is honestly the best gift. And alhamdulillah, I'm so glad that I'm Muslim, you know. So let's talk about how long and you have yeah. you and Hanan. So obviously you came here with your friend, yeah. you know, uh, you guys flew in from Dallas. Well, you she came from Toronto. I oh, came from Dallas. She came from Toronto. Yeah. Okay. And she came here because she's a Houstonian. Yeah, she lives in Houston, okay. but no, she lives in Toronto, but she came here for family and to okay. support me and all that. Okay, stuff. got it. And yeah. and so she flew from Toronto to support you for this podcast. This and um, her friend is also giving birth. <laughs> oh, okay. Makes sense. Now it makes sense. Okay, so let's walk walk us through that relationship. What was that like? You've known her since middle school. What's that like for you guys? Uh, so it's, it's good to have somebody who know the real me before all of my success and the things that, and she knows kind of what I've been through as well because she witnessed a lot of it firsthand. Um, and I just, I just keep remembering the days that we were in class and I was just always making faces at her and making her laugh and distracting her. And <laughs> um. do, you, do you feel like those are your real friends and that today because you have money, because you have fame, it's a little more difficult to make real friends like that? I, I do agree to an extent. My, um, it's good to cherish relationships um, that you've known before you become who you are. Um, but at the same time, the new people that walk into your life, you do have to keep an eye open because you, you don't know if they're trying to leech off your... Um, success or anything like this and really the relationships that I've built now um and my my friends have been have came from my business a lot of them are like family to me right so you surround yourself with people who are like in the business it's very similar to us I think mm -hmm. uh especially you know because you have the money because you have the fame you have to be v very selective and careful as to who you're trying because you just never know what people's intentions are yeah and i uh, haven't talked to hanan in a long time she reached out to me upset long essay <laughs> of how we have not stayed in touch and um i i told her as well like i was kind of disappointed you didn't stay in touch with me either but um we ended up just talking about everything and then now alhamdulillah like we're working together, inshallah, in real estate. She's helping me with my Excel sheets, and you know she's very talented and skilled, mashallah. So um, she's working on getting her license, and we're going to be closing deals together. And yeah. um, that 110 townhomes that I mentioned earlier in the podcast, um, the agent that's representing the seller, she was inspired by my Instagram posts when I was posting about real estate and got her license and. Now we're closing a big deal together and we're closing a, um, like a huge project, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, the people that I work with, they, there has to be some level of love and respect and trust. What would you say to people who are not on social media? 
Well, you have to see social media as a tool. It's a, a stage, right? You, you have the whole world in front of you. If you know who you are and what message you want to deliver, then you open other doors for you. It's just like walking into a portal, you know? Anything is possible. Yep. But when you have these limiting beliefs that, oh, social media is damaging, oh, I don't see the value of it, it's just a bunch of kids on there, you'll be surprised. I've had some, you know, million dollar developers reach out to me from social media. They're not just scrolling there. There's people that sent my listings, kids sent them to their parents and said, hey, look at this, you know, and a deal happened. So uh, social media is an extremely powerful platform if used correctly. Yeah. So it's funny you mentioned about the kids. So my business today is run, I would say 90% because of social media. Mm -hmm. So we got all our investors in our funds. I do all the, you know, and I just find it strange when I'm probably one of the only industrial funds in America that's on social media. It's that's how niche yep. down I am. And that's all I talk about. And people are like, Hamza, you're so repetitive. Well, I have to be repetitive. Mm -hmm. Look how much business it gets me. Right. Uh, and if we weren't on social media, it would just be the old traditional way. And I would have to go shake hands with like thousands of people. Yeah. People are door knocking nowadays. Yeah. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. Exactly. No. So. You initially did something different on your TikTok and then you moved into real estate. What was the traction you got on your initial, on your initial uh, TikTok uh, content versus then real estate? Like you, you said, you were talking about religion, you were talking about Islam, mm -hmm. and that's kind of how you initiated your TikTok, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And then, you and then you transitioned onto real estate. Yeah. What did that initial uh, conversation gain as far as traction and then you realize that hey hold on i can probably monetize on this yeah and then you moved on to yeah i mean when i realized that okay people people are looking up to me as you know a spiritual leader when i don't have more than five surahs memorized and um you know i've had alhamdulillah a few people convert in my life lifetime you know one one um, really nice, sweet uh, girl. Her, her name is um, um, Tegan. She's Jewish. She found my TikTok about, um, I was talking about Islam, and um, she took her shahada with me, you know. And you know, Palestinians and Israel were, were yeah. killing each other off, right? Well, they're, anyways, I don't want to get into that. But <laughs> um, yeah, she took her shahada with me. And really, it was just a video I put out there that I genuinely felt like it was advice that helped me and I just wanted to help somebody else with it. And subhanAllah, one person took the shahada. And um, I just didn't want to niche it down to just about the religion because that, that's not my expertise, you know. That's something that I value a lot. But I wanted to also people to know what I do, you know, and I wanted to be the knowledgeable broker in my industry. So I just started posting home tours. I just started posting uh, questions about um, commercial leases that you should ask and things like that, like um, figuring out what would a consumer look for in a realtor and just show up as that person. What would be, in your opinion, or if you had to advise somebody who wanted to get on social media to run their business, whatever it was, how consistent did they need to be? How much effort, like let's say I was you know, on a scale of one to 10, how much effort do they need to be putting on social media for their business? Well, it is something that you need to really think about to, and have fun. Don't make it seem like it's a job. Have fun with it. Because if you're not enjoying it, you need to have fun in everything that you're doing, you, you, that's the energy. It's mainly about energy. When, when you put a video out there and you're not feeling your best, it will not perform its best either. You need to be in a good high spirit and also figure out what messages you want to send out to the world and um, take the leap of faith. Don't worry about what anybody's gonna say about you. Just know who you are and not, not worry about the comments. I used to read the comments and it would affect the way I saw myself. I just stopped reading it. And um, yeah, I don't even respond to them. I'm gonna hire somebody to start responding to them. But don't take it to heart so much, have fun with it. Look at it as a way of just your stage, your, your platform for the whole world to see. Like realtors, we don't have a storefront that people can just walk in and do some shopping, no. I see social media as our storefront. Right. 
I think that's the case in every business today. Yeah. Social media is extremely important and you shouldn't take it too seriously, uh, especially with the comments and all that. Of course, you're a little younger than I am, so it impacts you a little more. For me, I'm actually looking for the haters because that's what <laughs> triggers the algorithm and that's what allows me I to like... You need to cause controversy. Exactly. So I will always use words that cause extreme controversy on my team. So I don't even like post. So I have a team that does yeah. that, but... Every time I, I have something very controversial, they're like, no, 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 don't say that. And I'm like, no, no, we that's need to say that. Say, yeah. And that's the one that gets the million, you know, million views or whatever it is. And that's kind of what I look for because I'm just having fun. You know, I, for me, it's just about having fun. So, I, that, you know, that's kind of what that matters. And the reason I bring up uh, what you did initially versus what you did later on is because I actually started my TikTok dancing. So I had sold my company mm. right before COVID. We had a massive exit. It was really nice. Uh, I was stuck at home, no business, pandemic, <laughs> we got stuck. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do? I have no work. I have no job. I just sold my mm -hmm. company. I, I had like seller's remorse because mm -hmm. I didn't want to sell it. <laughs> uh, so I just started dancing and doing skits on TikTok that were entertaining. And then I, th I think I got like 20,000 followers in a very wow. short amount of time. And I was like, I can't believe how many people want to watch this guy, like, uh, you know, me dance and do skits. And I, and I d have those videos still live till today. On, so if you scroll down enough on my TikTok, you get to see them. But then I realized, you know what? I can monetize on this. Let me see if I can make money trying to post uh, uh, videos and stuff. And so I started talking about real estate. And for those of you who know me and for those of you who don't, I hate multifamily because I used to be a multifamily. <laughs> I hate it. It's like the plague to me. You know? I would never invest in multifamily. Oh, but I man. used to talk about multifamily. Yeah. And I got really good traction on multifamily. And then I ditched it. I was like, you know what? Psh I don't want multifamily. I went to industrial, and now all I talk about is industrial. So what made you decide to get into industrial? I have a lot of clients looking yeah. to right now build. So, mm -hmm. so the reason I got into industrial is I had my multifamily fund, and we had, like I said, we grew to 1,400 doors, and we had a lot of investors. And on the side, what I was doing is I was building industrial business parks. And I had one assistant mm -hmm. who helped me with everything, and I used to, on my free time, go and watch my developments because they're really easy to build. Like, it's just single story, steel structure, prefab, mm -hmm. very, very easy to erect um, and very easy product. So I was like, okay, I build it. It's really easy. And then I got tenants and the tenants would just come. It was just easy. It was yeah. like, I didn't easy have to work to on them. I didn't have to do like, it wasn't complicated. They couldn't break anything. I would just leave lock boxes and they could go toward the property whenever they want. They send me a picture of their driver's license. Okay, go toward the property. This is the lock box code. There's nothing to damage. You know, it's an empty shell. Mm -hmm. uh, and this allowed them to go in, then bring their wife or bring their dog or bring their mom, whoever it was that was touring the property. And they were leasing spaces like that. And then I ended up selling it at a six cap. Mm. And, you know, industrial, yeah. like a six cap is pretty good. Well, maybe not now because the caps are compressed. Eight. But no. but back then, a six cap was amazing. And I got bought out by a fund. Mm. And they were like, hey, do you have any more deals? I'm like, no. They're like, well, could you bid, build more deals? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. They're like, we'll buy them all, all day. So nice. I secured my buyers before I even built the product. Mm. And then the more and more I dwelled in, like the more and more I got into that world, I realized that there's a ton of buyers and they're all institutional buyers. So I'm not selling to mom and pop. Yeah. Mom and pop, it's like, oh, this is broken, fix this. Institutional buyers, they come in, they're spending $200,000 in due diligence between hotels, mm -hmm. flights, you know, survey, like just studies that they're doing about the area and all that. These guys are serious. Blackstone uh, and Elo uh, what is Elogix, they're, they're both fighting over right now uh, warehouses. Right. So, so, you know, I realized that it's just such an easy business to get into and get out of. And I had first-hand experience. So I was like, okay, forget multifamily. It's too much work. So multifamily, yeah. I'll give you examples. I have property managers that got shot. Oh, my goodness. I have tenants that got shot. I have tenants so that each other. Yeah. And I think that's bright that you got into it because we have all these online stores as well who um, need to store their... Sure. So e-commerce actually is not a big part of my business. Okay. I'm, I cater mainly to like service businesses, like, okay. like lawnmower rental companies, mm. landscaping companies, home repair companies. Uh, Pulte, Pulte Homes took a, took a space from us for their home inspection mm. uh, processes and you know all that. We have telecommunication companies, cabling companies. Uh, AT&T comes in, takes spaces. In a recession, it's really cool because what happens to us is because we have such small uh, spaces, mm -hmm. larger companies that have 50,000, 100,000 square feet footprints now need to downsize. So they create added pressure in our flex spaces alongside the new guys who want to come do business. So in 2016, when we had the oil and gas crisis mm -hmm. here, 
my rents were at all time highs, not from the new guys, mm -hmm. from the companies that are downsizing into 1,500, 3,000, 12,000 square feet spaces. So it's pretty interesting how the dynamic of that whole thing works. Uh, <laughs> let's go a little upbeat and talk about what the future holds. Uh, let's talk about your success and you know what you plan on doing over the next couple of years. So obviously you're super successful. Uh, we see it all over social media. You're taking a break right now, but you're gonna come back. Yeah, stronger. And, and, and walk us through that. Yeah, so I'm actually in the process uh, because a big part of my branding is innovation, right? Um, I'm in the process of creating a real estate app that's going to re revolutionize the way real estate is bought and sold. And it's also going to be um, an easy way for buyers and sellers to connect without broker fees. Um, so you're going to eliminate the broker? Well, the brokers will need to subscribe to me to receive leads. Got it. Yeah, so it's like Uber, you know how Uber drivers turn on their 12 hours shift and then they get, you know, somebody just ordered an Uber, they get, the, they drive there, right? It'll be the same thing where you don't ever have to meet the agent. You don't ever have to, um, the agent ha doesn't have to look for deals, right? Um, a deal is made because the buyer and the seller have came to an agreement. They've already provided their documents. It will be remote closing as well. The inspection have been scheduled, everything's ready to go. Um, and all you'll have to do is just draft the contract and um, okay. follow through. And does this have any like blockchain type stuff in it or is this? No blockchain. Okay, this so will be a real estate app. Okay. Um, and my competitors will be CoStar, Zillow, Got it. Um, Crexy. Got it. So you're, you're creating basically a platform where you can tackle the big guys. So is your, is your goal to get bought out by them or is your goal to literally go after them? No, partner with them. Okay, so use all their, uh, is, are there API integrations between? They, yeah, I'm gonna need their um, geographic. Okay. Uh, yeah, integrations and. Um, and, the, and will CoStar give, like provide those? Because I know CoStar is really strict on that. Unless they're willing to partner in because it's, it's a billion dollar it's a billion dollar app. Okay, got and, it. Yeah. <laughs> so walk me through that. I, I, I still kind of don't understand what the app is. So, so let's say you're a buyer and I'm a seller, right? And instead of me going on Google looking for a realtor to hire, right? Um, wouldn't you want to, uh, like the seller, right? Let's say he wants to liquidate some of his assets. This is gonna be not only just in Texas or um, nationwide, it'll be international as well. Um, so he puts, he uploads his property online for $0. If it transacts, I would take a 1% fee and there's some other attorney fees, title fees, blah, 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 that will come in the mix of things. Um, and once he uploads it, you're the buyer. Let's say you're looking to 1031 exchange into a property. The best this buyers. is going to be a 1031 exchange friendly app. The buyer decides to get on puts up his filters, what he's looking for, he's gonna start swiping until he matches with the property he wants. A match happens, they're serious to move forward, they provide their proof of funds, whatever is needed, um, and then that's when we'll call the agent to draft up the contract, put it all together, and we go from there. And obviously these agents have to meet certain requirements because I wanna uphold a certain standard in my business where it's not just going to be a newbie realtor come in, never done this deal before, and messes it up for me, you know? So, um, whatchamacallit. So then that would be transacting. Instead of me actively searching for the buyer and the seller and making the connection, I'm going to put it all in one platform where, let's say, you have 45 days to find a similar property to what you already have. You can easily just open the app and look. And for the seller, they have nothing to lose, let's say they already have it listed with another broker online and it's not even selling. They add it to the app, they get more exposure for their property. This will allow people from Dubai, Qatar, other um, countries to also see that property, not just limited to the states. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And vice versa. So you will be, be targeting the exchange. world mm -hmm. to buying stuff in the US for people who are looking at opportunity here. And then eventually- Not just the US. So the whole if people want to also buy internationally as well, um, they can do that. Okay. But it'll be 1031 exchange friendly. Okay, so your clients are basically people who are in a hurry, who are willing to pay, who just need to do this so that they don't have to pay Uncle Sam. That or if somebody just wants maximum exposure for their listing. Okay, got it. It'll be for residential and commercial. Okay, and, and you, you said something like they're just going to keep swiping. Is it going to be like a Tinder type app? Where yes. you're like, I like this, I don't like this, and then it yeah. kind of gauges 
what you're liking and it shows you that type of product? Well, you're going to have to, you have filters to choose from where it goes exactly Got to it. the category. So it's not out of range. Where'd you get that idea? You thought about it? Yes. <laughs> All yours. All mine. And, and who's going to build it? I have a few uh, pieces. It's I already got the eyes of the business, the ears, the arms, everything. So Okay, so you're just going to put it all together. I'm putting it together. Okay. And this is top secret information. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know how top secret it is anymore. <laughs> they can't recreate the sauce. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Nobody can really recreate it. They can try, but, you know, they don't come close. It's very interesting. That's really good to hear. Well, it looks like the future is bright. It was really good talking to you. Uh, thank you once again for coming, visiting my office and, you know, the studio and my family. Uh, and we really, we really enjoyed having you here and hearing more about you. Thank you so much for having me.